。美国总统大选史上最激烈的一次，谁能够入主白宫？是川普还是贺锦丽？台湾时间十一月六号早上八点，也是美国纽约时间十一月五号晚上八点，小军川 Plus 独步领先所有自媒体，破天荒，台湾、美国两地十二个小时马拉松开票连线直击。我即将在美国华盛顿 DC 为你现场直击，包括了跟学者专家有民居正、沈明世、苏子云、余宗基、宋国成、陈松新。苏思睿、Peter、桑普、石板民夫、吴家龙，美国在台协会台北办事处的前处长司徒文，以及赵怡翔。包括连线到美国西部，因为民进党中央党部的执行长了王毅川代表民进党要参访，好好观察这一次美国总统大选。我们即将也要跟他进行连线，要共同见证这一场大选的结果，因为这个结果将攸关美中台三方的权力洗牌，千万不要错过。十一月六号台北时间早上八点，锁定小军台湾 Plus。记者现在就在白宫的北侧，我们可以看到呢，我的这个背后正架起了高高的铁的栅栏，而在这个栅栏的背后呢，有好几台的工程车在那施工。这是为了什么呢？这是为了在二零二五年一月二十号的美国总统就职典礼做准备。那我们看到呢，它里头也正在新建观礼台。那不过呢，也因为这样的维安措施啊，把白宫给围了起来，导致有一些来到华盛顿的观光客觉得没有办法就近跟白宫拍照，有点扫。性对，特别是白宫，他现在围起来了，就也不好拍照，就是不能打卡的话，确实还是蛮可惜。待个三天吧，就来这边简单玩一下。是的，刚好选举到，我会不会顺便看一下这个这个现场那种盛况？嗯，应该应该不会过来吧，因为感觉还是不太能围观哈，还是自身安全比较重要。Yeah, we wanted to see the White House. That's why that was one of the reasons. But、uh, no, it's not really possible at the moment. But it's well, the the Uh, it's clear also why, but、uh, yeah, it's a pity. There are talks like over some yeah anxiety and some frustration in the、uh, in in the well society. So yeah, civil war. I mean, it's a big word, but something. People are talking that there might be something happening. Well, a little bit this morning. I mean, instead of having an errand to do over here, and you can't. You can't pass through here anymore, and so I asked the Secret Service guy, you know, how long it would be up. He said till March. You know, it's like half the country can't, on each side, can't figure out why it's even close. You know what I mean? How can this be 50-50? And both sides probably have an argument. You know, so either way, it's going to be half the country's conflict. Probably going to be pretty upset. I wouldn't go out looking to celebrate or protest either way. I mean, I think you're, you know, you're asking. Maybe get hurt. 那么除了观光客以及华盛顿当地的居民对这个大选之后的局势有点忧虑之外呢，我们看到白宫附近的这个商家店铺也纷纷的进行了自己的维安措施，包括用这个厚厚的木板把他们的外墙保护了起来。特别是有这个玻璃门以及玻璃窗的部分啊，玻璃墙的部分，整用这个厚厚的木板从下到上都把它围了起来。为什么呢？就是担心说，如果大选之后可能有一些不满的民众上街的时候。可能会对他们的店铺外观造成了一些的损害，因此呢，做这样的一个措施。那么上次呢，白宫附近的商家做这样的一个保安措施的时候呢，是在二零二一年一月二十日的美国总统就职之前。美国之音黄耀义、刘文明，华盛顿报道。今年早些时候，共和党总统候选人特朗普对多家媒体表示，如果十一月五日总统选举的结果诚实、公平和自由，他会接受。选举官员们相信投票过程将公平、安全和透明，但这位前总统越来越担心他的对手可能实施欺诈。我们能够遏制这种作弊行为，因为他们都是骗子。如果我们能够遏制这种作弊行为，我们将取得巨大的胜利。副总统卡马拉·哈里斯上个月在接受美国全国广播公司 （NBC） 晚间新闻莱斯特·霍尔特采访时，告诉 NBC 新闻主播哈利·杰克逊：“如果特朗普败选，但企图颠覆选举结果，他的团队将做好准备。我们将应对选举之夜和选举后的日子。我们拥有资源和专业知识，并且也专注于此。”共和党全国委员会在各大战场州实施了所谓的选举诚信计划。
，其一律师已就投票违规问题提起了一百多起诉讼，但许多诉讼被法院驳回。民主党已启动自己的法律行动，包括提起诉讼，以防止佐治亚州选举结果认证程序可能出现的延迟。在今年这样激烈的总统竞选中，预计会出现法律纠纷。分析人士预测，大多数诉讼将发生在摇摆州。At the polling place, we often see. 在投票站，我们经常看到关于选票是否得到妥善处理的争论。在选举日后的一段时间内，对于某些选民是否真正符合资格，以及他们的临时选票是否应该投进去，是否计入投票数字，存在争议。然而，法律专家警告说，任何声称存在欺诈的人都必须提供证据。律师们要小心你的指控，确保你能证明它，否则可能会受到纪律处分。正如我们在二零二零年的选举中看到的那样。例如，特朗普的前律师朱利安尼因散布二零二零年大选的胜利是被窃取的、毫无根据的言论而被吊销律师执照。法律纠纷可能会推迟总统选举的结果，但是如果周二晚上的结果明显有利于一位总统候选人，并且优势相当大。分析人士表示，对方党派会很难对这些结果提出异议。美国之音记者伊格莱西亚斯，华盛顿报道。The Fox News decision desk can now project that former Vice President Joe Biden has been elected President of the United States. It was supposed to be the end, but when the end came, Donald J. Trump, 45th President of the United States, wasn't ready to admit defeat. If you count the legal votes, I easily win. If you count the illegal votes, they can try to steal the election from us. Trump urged supporters to prevent Congress from certifying those results on January 6, 2021. We fight like hell, and if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. What resulted was a scene previously unimaginable in America, that led to his second impeachment. Trump's unwillingness to take no for an answer was on brand for a man who has always burned convention. I think what you see is somebody who has incredible confidence in his own intuition. Russ Butner and Suzanne Craig are New York Times investigative reporters and co-authors of Lucky Loser, an unflattering look at how Trump fashioned himself into a self-made billionaire. He has not, since the early '80s, really trusted people who have. Subject area expertise on almost anything. He will always overrule them to make things the way he wants them to turn out. Trump's buildings were emblazoned with his name in large gold letters, a brash display of his ambition and self-promotion. He was worth two hundred million when he would talk. It was the interview he gave to the New York Times, and that grew to a billion dollars when he was talking to sixty minutes a decade later. Trump excelled at drawing attention and cultivating a brand for himself as a deal maker. He made millions licensing his name. But behind the success were troubles. His companies filed for bankruptcy six times. His casinos lost money and were shuttered. Trump rebounded with his TV show The Apprentice, which led to his biggest role yet. Ladies and gentlemen, I am officially running for president of the United States, and we are going to make our country great again. Unapologetic and unfiltered, Trump was a polarizing nationalist candidate. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. As president, Trump appointed three Supreme Court justices who helped overturn federal abortion rights. The U.S. death toll now above 150,000. In early 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic tested Trump. He fast-tracked the development of life-saving vaccines, but he also appeared to suggest that scientists study injecting bleach to kill the virus. With over 9 million Americans infected and a death toll exceeding 230,000, voters that November chose Joe Biden as their next president. Out of office, Trump faced multiple criminal indictments and is the first former president to be a convicted felon. And yet, he has never been more popular than he is now. Surviving two assassination attempts this year has only strengthened the bond between him and his supporters. God has a plan for Trump, and 
he absolutely was spared for some purpose and reason, and hopefully it's to become the 47th president. American politics has never been the same since Donald Trump entered the field. And the man who once co-authored The Art of the Comeback may now be engineering one of the biggest in American history. Tina Trin, VOA News, New York. My mother was a brilliant, five-foot-tall, brown woman with an accent. Born in 1964, Kamala Harris's story begins in the diverse and progressive neighborhoods of the San Francisco Bay Area. Her immigrant parents, Shyamala Gopalan from India and Donald Harris from Jamaica, met in Berkeley, California, where the two gifted graduate students arrived to study at the University of California. Here it is to give you a message of hope. 1960s Berkeley was a center of civil rights and peace activism. Harris has said her earliest memories are of being taken to rallies in a stroller. By 1970, the Harris's marriage had ended. Shyamala Gopalan, with her two daughters, found an apartment to rent in an area of Berkeley known as the Flatlands. So they lived above the daycare center, above Shelton's daycare, in a modest two-bedroom, one-bath apartment. Childhood friend Carol Porter first met Harris at the school bus stop. We were the second class to desegregate Berkeley Public Schools. Harris went on to Howard University, a historically black college, and then law school. At a time when record levels of black men were incarcerated in California, she took a job as a prosecutor, a role often viewed negatively in the African-American community. She wanted to go in and change things so that people weren't being prosecuted the way that they were based on systemic and structural racism. In 2002, Harris took on the incumbent in a race for San Francisco district attorney. There had never been a woman district attorney. She was really an underdog. But from the beginning, she had something very special. Harris won the close race and set to work increasing convictions and prison time for violent offenders, while steering those convicted of first-time nonviolent crimes into her rehabilitation program called Back on Track. Elected Attorney General of California in 2010, she pressured U.S. banks into a $20 billion settlement over deceptive lending practices, took on the cross-border drug trade and human traffickers, and advocated for marriage equality. In 2016, Harris was elected to the U.S. Senate, where she quickly rose as a powerful voice on issues of immigration, health care, and criminal justice reform. Known for her sharp questioning during hearings and her ability to hold powerful leaders accountable, Harris became a prominent figure on the national stage. But in a 2020 run for president, Harris's campaign struggled to find direction amid staff chaos. There's definitely been stories about high staff turnover, um, inability to keep talented people in her orbit. Biden won the nomination and ultimately asked Harris to join the ticket as his vice president. The two went on to victory, making her the first woman and the first person of color to win that office. Faced with a surge of migrants attempting to cross the U.S. southern border, Vice President Harris engaged with regional leaders to address instability and poverty. She quickly became a political target. She was supposed to be the one that was in charge of securing our border. And I don't even know if she's been down there yet. Harris has grown more comfortable serving as an emissary on the world stage, emphasizing support and soothing tensions. And in a career defined by breaking barriers and exceeding expectations, Harris rose again, becoming the Democratic nominee for president when Joe Biden unexpectedly dropped out of the race. Matt Dibble, VOA News, Oakland, California. So for President of the United States, I think like a lot of Americans and Chinese Americans, I've been undecided. I've been a proud Republican most of my life. In, in this particular election, for me, it's about the candidate. I don't support President Trump, but I also do not support Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, 
，因因为就是就就有有一个这个抛切感，对吧？然所所以我觉得民主党呢，就我我我在费城还去了一个，就专门针对亚裔的一个，呃，一一个就是一个竞选的一个一个活动，所以所以就说民主党对亚裔非常是非常尊重，非常呃非非常注重的一个一个党。加州大学圣巴巴拉分校政治学教授连佩德说：“他所在的加州向来是民主党票仓，也有比较多亚裔选民，过去鲜少见到竞选广告。然而，这次选战却能看到大量来自双方阵营的广告，显示竞争极为激烈。在华人圈这边来讲的话呢，我们其实本来就相当的分歧，比起其他的这个亚裔族群来讲的话，华人是很大的一块，最大的一块其实。但是我们也来自四面八方。”候选人对中国的政策是萨姆尔城关注的重点。他认为共和党多年来在对抗中共上展现了道德勇气和明确性，能更好地带领美国向中国问责。China and the rise of Xi Jinping in China is a serious international issue. It's an issue for our economy because our economy is so reliant on China. It's an issue for our national security. Uh, it's an issue for our relationship with Taiwan, but everybody is afraid to deal with Xi Jinping in China because of the economic ties. So it needs to start there. We need to divest our economic interests in China、uh, before we can take a stronger political stance against them. And so it needs a president who understands the reality of that relationship, and then has the courage to stand up to them both politically and economically. 民主党选民史蒂夫杨则认为，两党对中国政策实际上相当相似，但民主党在与中国打交道上表现更好。拜登和习近平这个呃有有这有这些教导下，苏苏呃呃沙利文是八月份去了北京，呃耶伦去了北京非非常多次。我我觉得这个对中美关系来说，我觉得最重要的是我们必须得找地方来合作。然后呢，就说因因为当然就说我们这两个国家是完全是不能去去去打仗的，呃，冷战还是热战，我们是呃不不能去，因因为我我我觉得哈，就说美国人民不不想再再打战。史蒂夫杨也期望新总统能拟平激烈选战造成的分歧。我们现在政治的这个这个体系就是。我们必须得回到就是两千年，呃，叫二零一七年以前的这个，呃，这个尊重，更有有尊敬，让更友好的一个呃这个政治的一个 conversation。然后我我们也看见就是副总统这个辩论的时候 ，J.D. Vance 和 Tim Walz 他们俩沟通就非常尊敬的。然后他们呃辩论的是在美政策，他他们也也没有呃那种人人人性攻击。这个是呃政治应应该我我们应我们的政治原来也是，然后然后应该是这样的，我们能回到这个就是尊敬，然然后更呃呃更安静的一个这个呃在英文叫 political discourse。It's known as the Peach State, Georgia, home to big entertainment and agricultural industries, a majority minority population. And as part of the Bible Belt, it's one of the most religious states in the U.S. It's also one of seven swing states that will likely decide the presidential election. In 2020, President Joe Biden pulled out a surprising victory in Georgia, breaking its nearly three-decade-long cycle of voting for Republican presidential nominees. But in the 2024 rematch between Biden and former President Donald Trump, polls showed Trump was likely to win Georgia back. But then, Good evening, Georgia. When Kamala Harris got into the race, immediately Georgia became a toss-up again. Reporter Tia Mitchell of the Atlanta Journal Constitution unpacks this southern election battleground. Roughly 50 percent of all voters in Georgia live in Metro Atlanta, versus the rest of the state. And so Atlanta's very blue, and then most other parts of the state get pretty red. But a lot of people are moving to Georgia, which explains in part why Democrats were able to win in 2020, albeit by a slim margin of 0.3 percentage points. A lot of young people are moving to Georgia. A lot of people of color are moving to Georgia. Georgia has the highest population and proportion of Black Americans of the seven swing states. The black vote is really important,、um, particularly for Kamala Harris, and we know that、um, Donald Trump has gone after black and brown voters in states like Georgia, particularly black and brown men, black and Latino men, with his messaging. The polling shows that black men are coming in for Kamala Harris around seventy percent. 
That's less than Biden ultimately got in 2020 and less than Hillary Clinton got in 2016. If a Democrat can't get black men in the upper, you know, 80s, upper 80s, it will be difficult to win. Like voters nationally, Georgians say inflation and the cost of living are their top concerns. But another big issue that comes up a lot is immigration. Georgia is not a border state, but certain parts of Georgia have seen a lot of immigrants come and settle there. But also because Georgia is heavy on the agriculture industry, I think people are more keenly aware of immigration and immigration issues in a state like Georgia. Another issue that could be a rallying cry, particularly for women, is abortion. After the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, Georgia was one of four states to ban abortion beyond six weeks of pregnancy. That's before many women even know they're pregnant. There was recently a ProPublica investigation that found that two women had complications after uh, doing medicated abortions and either didn't get the care they needed from the hospital or avoided going to the hospital because they were concerned about the quality of care. And both of them died and the state determined those deaths were preventable. And that's become a big issue on the campaign trail, particularly raised by Kamala Harris saying it's one of the byproducts of the state having a very restrictive abortion ban. Mitchell says Georgia voters are also concerned about crime and public safety, including guns. About six weeks ago, there was a school shooting in Georgia that was the deadliest school shooting in the state's history. And so that has um, really shaped the conversation around gun control and public safety. Donald Trump was going to speak to at an NRA event in Savannah. He canceled the event. And I think it even indicates um, that Donald Trump himself and his advisors didn't necessarily think a pro-gun message was a good closing argument in a state like Georgia. Georgia has been a poster child for kind of this effort to preserve democracy, this effort to label Donald Trump as a threat to democracy. Georgia is the site of an ongoing election interference case against Trump and his allies. After he lost the 2020 election, Trump pressured Georgia's Secretary of State in a phone call to find him 11,780 votes, roughly the same number by which Biden won the state. Last year, a grand jury indicted Trump and 18 others on charges that they tried to overturn Georgia's 2020 election results. A trial date is pending. I think it plays both ways. There are Democrats who believe, you know, we've got to preserve democracy and not let Donald Trump get back to the White House. There are a lot of Republicans who believe that the legal system has been weaponized against former President Trump and that um, he should be rewarded by being allowed to go back to the White House. And once he does that, they expect him to do away with a lot of these pending cases. A recent poll by the Atlanta Journal-Constitution found Trump ahead in Georgia with 47 percent support and Harris with 43 percent. 美国总统大选史上最激烈的一次 Sussuri